afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Scotland's Foraging Festival Online. My name is Heather Woodbridge, and I'll be your host for this afternoon's talk. And it is my pleasure to be hosting this session from Orkney. Um, the Foraging Fortnight is a celebration of Scotland's natural environment and wild food. It is supported by leader funding and by Scottish Natural Heritage or Nature Scott. Once again, the Foraging Festival is part of the Orkney International Science Festival. And this year, we are delighted to bring a full festival programme directly to you wherever, wherever you are at the moment. Today, I'm joined here by Dan, who joined us from Mauritius. Dan Poplett has had a passion for the natural world from an early age. He has been involved with a wide range of conservation and environmental education projects and has worked for Trees for Life for over 11 years. Dan has also studied a variety of uh, naturalist and wilderness skills and is the author of the FSC Guide to British Bird Tracks and Signs. So, and this afternoon, he'll be taking us on a tour with his talk, Hedrows to Coastline, a Moray outing. So, hello, Dan, how are you? Hi, Heather. Yeah, really good, thanks. How are you doing? Good to be here. Yeah, not, not too bad. How are you keeping there? Looks like lovely sunshine where you are at the moment. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's a cool but kind of fairly bright day, a few showers. It's, it's great, yeah. Fantastic. Well, are you are you ready to go over to the video, Dan? Would you like to say anything before we begin? Yeah, sure. Let's, um, yeah, just a, a brief intro. I suppose that the video um, is from part of partly right where I am, uh, Marquisy Farm, Rafford and Forest in Murray. And then we also head out to the coast as well. So looking at a, a variety of different wild foods. So, yeah, let's take a look. Fantastic. Great. Hi, I'm Dan Puplett. I'm a naturalist, conservationist and environmental educator and I'm excited to be taking part in Foraging Fortnight, which is a celebration of Scotland's fantastic natural environment and wild foods. We're here at Marcusy Farm near Forres in Murray where we'll be taking a look, at, look around at some of the wild foods that are here and we'll also be heading down to the coast to see some of the things on offer there as well. Among the many things that I love about foraging is that it's a great way for people to reconnect with nature. It can help us get a better understanding of the plants, the wildlife and the broader environment around us and hopefully help to develop a, a greater sense of respect for nature as well. Being out in nature engaged in activities like foraging can also be really good for our physical and our mental health and well-being. It's also a good way to get some free nutritious and tasty ingredients too and something that can be accessible to anyone there's we don't need to necessarily go that far there's often things right on our doorsteps that we can forage and of course it almost goes without saying that when we forage we want to do it as safely and sustainably as possible so that means being 100 percent positive of the things that we're about to eat and also making sure that they're not from a contaminated source of any kind. And in terms of sustainability, of making sure that we're just not taking too much of anything. And I tend to like focusing on the commoner species because then there's much less chance that we're going to have a negative impact. Ideally, where possible, we can even help to encourage wild places to thrive for the future. So actually having a net positive benefit is something that foragers can do as well. And also when we're gathering, it's important just to watch even where we're treading. It can be easy to damage other plants without realising it. So just having that extra awareness um, not to create too much impact as we actually forage. So with that in mind, let's go and see what treats are in store. This is among my favourite wildflowers at this time of year. This is creeping thistle and it's a really common thistle and easy to identify the flowers are quite a pale lilac colour and really fragrant as well and they make a delicious tea if you steep some of the flower heads in some just boiled water. The tea is really lovely, it has a quite a honey-like flavour. Thistles, including creeping thistle, are really good for insects as well. Bumblebees, honeybees, butterflies and other 
insects really, really like these flowers. So here we have a real treat for foragers. This is hazel and you can see it's got this fairly rounded, very bristly leaf with a point on the end. One of the key ID features though at this time of year are the actual nuts and this is another good year for hazelnuts. Last year was pretty good as well and so we've got a bumper crop on its way. One of the interesting things I find about hazelnuts is that there's been archaeological evidence found on the island of Colonsay and there were charred remains of hazelnuts from about seven and a half thousand years ago showing that people actually were um, cooking the hazelnuts by burying, burying them and having a fire on top as a way of cooking it makes them much more digestible so um, they've had a really long history of use in Scotland and that's a method I still use on some of my foraging courses and other things you can do with hazelnuts as well uh, making things like hazelnut butter which is absolutely delicious each hazelnut represents a real dense package of nutrients of fats and proteins so because of that they're a really valuable source of food for wildlife including squirrels various smaller rodents as well as birds including woodpeckers and others these ones aren't quite ripe just yet but in a few weeks time they should easily be ready to harvest rose hips as the fruits of roses are known are another easy to identify wild edible there are a few species of rose in this country and this one right behind me here is an introduced species called Rosa rugosa or the Japanese rose, sometimes known as the sea tomato. You can see why when you see these quite round hips that it has. And these can often be found growing wild now along the coast. They do pretty well there. It's quite well known that rose hips are really high in vitamin C, weight for weight. They have more than oranges even. And there's various ways that we can eat them. They can be eaten raw, but it's really important first to get rid of the seeds because surrounding the seeds there are these irritant hairs which is a really good idea to avoid. And that's one of the things I like about the sea tomato is that it's quite easy to process and get rid of the seeds. So all we have to do is either cut or break open the fruit and inside we can see the seeds there. And then you can use a teaspoon or even just your thumb and scrape out with your nails, sc scrape out the, the seeds. This is if you want to pick and eat as you go along, making sure you got rid of all those hairs just by scraping them out and then you have the skin and some of the pulps that were surrounding the seeds. And that is really tasty. It's quite sweet and a little bit juicy as well. The other kinds we have, like um, dog rose, which is one of our native ones, are really nice as well. They're just a bit more fiddly to process. An easy way to process the smaller dog rose hips is to actually make them into syrup. And there are quite a lot of um, recipes available to show you how to do that. And that was actually really encouraged during the Second World War. There was concern because citrus imports were limited. Um, there was concern that people would suffer from vitamin deficiency, so people were encouraged to gather rose hips en masse and make syrup to provide vitamin C. There are quite a few of our wild roses, including the, the naturalised Rosa rugosa, that are good for bees. It tends to be that cultivated roses with lots of layers of petals aren't really accessible to bees, but our, our wild ones are. And the hips are also valuable for birds as well and it's quite common to find these um, the sea tomatoes that have been pecked open by finches getting at the seeds you also see that with dog rose hips as well at times and then there are birds like blackbirds and waxwings which really like the fruits like the flesh of the fruit so certain birds go for the flesh and certain birds go for the seeds this tree right behind me here is really easy to identify at this time of year in late summer with these clusters of bright orange red berries it also has this compound leaf so there's a central stalk and pairs of leaflets alongside making up the whole leaf and 
rounds yet another wild plant that's really high in vitamin C and it's not a good idea though to eat the berries raw apart from tasting pretty grim they actually contain a chemical which can give you stomach upsets but if you cook them the chemical is destroyed and they're fine to eat. The classic way to eat rowan berries is in rowan jelly which is this really sharp jelly that's traditionally served with game, with lamb, it's nice with cheese as well. The flowers of rowan are pollinated by various flies and other insects and the berries themselves, as you can probably imagine, are really popular with birds, particularly migrant thrushes such as red wings and field fares when they arrive in early autumn really feast on these berries and when we get wax wings over they also love rowan berries too. There's a lot of folklore associated with the rowan across the British Isles and it's often thought of as a tree that protects against evil and in the Scottish Highlands it's quite common to see houses that have a rowan tree planted out the front and that was they were thought to have protective properties and there's even a taboo against cutting down rowan trees. We're here on the fantastic Murray Coast. It's a brilliant place for wildlife as well as for wild food foraging. So we're going to go on a bit further and find one of my favourite coastal plants. Just behind me on the bank here, we have one of my favourite coastal wild edibles. This is scurvy grass all up here, and I'll show you it a bit closer. So it's not a grass at all, as you can see. This is actually a member of the cabbage or mustard family. And when it's in flower, it has these little four petaled white flowers. And other members of that family also have four petaled flowers. And the leaf has this kind of heart or kidney shaped leaf that's really succulent as well and this one up on the bank here this patch is well out of the dog zone so it's safe to eat and it's really succulent and has a flavor a lot like horseradish it's kind of like salty horseradish really like it and it's really nice mixed through a salad with other leaves and um, as you probably can guess from the name um, it was used in the past as a source of vitamin C. It was used by mariners a lot, but people have been at sea for long periods of time, not been able to get much vitamin C, and so when they got to land, this would be a really welcome source of that vitamin. And um, there's reports of it being used on Captain Cook's expeditions and others. It's also been used over the centuries by various island and coastal communities in Scotland particularly at times when other vegetables might have been scarce, so a really important way to, to supplement the, the people's diet. So thanks very much for watching. I hope you enjoy your time getting out there and getting involved in some safe and sustainable foraging. Great. Well, thank you very much. That was an excellent film, Dan. Thank you very much. Are, are you still with us, Dan? I am, yep. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. I can't see you, but I can, oh, I can see you now. Fantastic. Well, that was just, that was brilliant. I'm, I'm thinking I've got so many creeping thistles in my garden. I'll just have to try that tea. <laughs> it is really nice. Give them, give them a sniff as well, because it's surprising like how, how nice they smell. Even like compared to some other thistles, it's quite noticeable. Oh. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, I, I certainly will do. Oh, it was great. Um, now, I think we've got some uh, questions and hopefully some answers um, to go through. So I'll just get those up and I'll see what folk have been writing into us here. Let's see. So we've got a question from Rick Wa Walker. Um, oh. And I think that might be a question really for Kathleen about where to find the events program. Let's see. Oh, I've got a question from Eric Walker. How did you end up living in Forestan? Uh, so how was it? It was actually initially to 
um, work for, I moved up here to work for Trees for Life, as you mentioned before. So those who don't know, Trees for Life is a, a conservation charity involved in, in rewilding a large area of the highlands. And I moved up, it was 20 years ago. And as you mentioned, I worked for Trees for Life for about 11 years and just absolutely fell in love with this area. So I, that's how I'm here, basically. Fabulous. Lovely part of the world. I have to go visit again. Lovely place. Uh, let's see. Uh, a question from Kathleen Hogarth. Um, what do you think would the best steps be to increase awareness and for respect for nature? Oh, that's a great question, actually. Um, and yeah, so I think it's quite a long answer to it, or there's lots of different strands to, to it. But I think one of the, the big things is actually creating, a like helping people build a direct personal connection with the natural world. So I think information is really valuable, really has its place. But as we've seen, I think as we can see, we've got all the information we ever need at our fingertips. And we still have like huge environmental problems. And I think really the best way to get people to act in a way that's like respectful of and beneficial to the natural environment is to actually create this personal connection. And so as an example, things like, especially with children, I think it's important with adults as well, but I think children are going to be the decision makers of the future. So doing things like giving them experiences where they really have enjoyable encounters, whether it's with wildlife, or with plants, things that are fun as well, just things that build some sense of familiarity because I think the other option is that kids become kind of less and less ecologically literate. And I think our society generally is becoming less familiar with even really simple things. Like it would be surprising. Like I've, I've worked with kids um, a fair bit from time to time and kind of surprising like how few kids may even be able to recognize a dandelion or really simple things. So I think building that connection, fun experiences, and from that comes an appreciation and then hopefully a desire to, to protect protect what's around us. So, and the same can apply for adults as well, you know, just I think um, enabling people to have experiences where they're um, yeah, enjoying, enjoying the outdoors and appreciating it. And foraging, that's what one of the things I love about foraging is a great gateway into that when we're out there and even picking simple stuff like brambles or whatever they just become for most people there's more of an appreciation and hopefully a willingness to protect and restore the natural world fantastic i mean i can't think of a better engagement activity than foraging fantastic and you know for young young folk getting that that first sort of really positive experience of the outdoors fantastic yeah, yeah. okay we'll we'll move on to our next question if you're if you're okay there dan let's see what we've got here um, oh, we've got a question about mushrooms here from Richard Oakley. Um, do, you, do you know what percentage of wild plants, fruits and mushrooms are edible and non-poisonous? So what, it, what is out there? What, what can we forage? OK, that's, that's a great question, Richard. I couldn't actually put a percentage on it. And when it comes mm. to mushrooms, like fungus, fungi generally are just fascinating organisms. You know, they're not plants, they're not animals, they're their own thing. And... In the UK, we have thousands of species and a lot of them only like a, a trained mycologist could identify. I think, mm. and it's just like, a, I couldn't give a percentage, but there's quite a few of them which are maybe edible, but probably just not that nice. They're, as mm. everyone, portion that are really, really poisonous and some that are um, really, really delicious. And I tend to focus with mushrooms, tend to focus on just a small handful that are really easy mm. to identify and stuff. I guess that doesn't directly answer the question, but more, I guess, more to the point with plants, um, just in this, like in the, say in the north of Scotland, a mm. uh, few years ago, I did a kind of a bit of a calculation and there's probably about 250 of our wild plants. And I haven't actually calculated how many wild plants we have in the north of Scotland, but 250 of them are actually edible and, or over 250. Now, that, that isn't to say it's a good idea to eat all of them. Some of them are, some of them taste grim. You don't want to eat them. Some of them um, are too rare to pick, so we need to leave them well alone. Some of them are too hard to identify safely. It's much better to focus on things that are hard to mistake. And um, but there, are, so there's a good proportion that are edible. But as everyone knows as well, with plants as well as with fungi, there are 
a number, and it's not a huge number, but there are um, a handful of uh, wild plants that are absolutely deadly, things like hemlock, mm. water dropwort, which is in, they're both in the carrot family. The carrot family is one that generally is not good to mess too much with wild plants in the carrot family. Um, and a few others in things like foxglove as well, which is more familiar. And mm. some, there's, so it's definitely the minority that are deadly poisonous, but the fact that they are there just mm. definitely is a kind of a, a sobering reminder. And at the same time, it's not to kind of freak people out about foraging. It's just like, just have that really healthy awareness, be 100% sure of what you're identifying. Mm. Focus on the stuff that's really mm. easy to identify, first of all. Learn a few po mm. poison lookalikes is always a good idea as well. And then you'll be on safe mm -hmm. ground. So I can't give you exact percentages, but that gives some sense of kind of like the what's mm -hmm. edible and what's Mm -hmm. So, you know, know your stuff and, you know, really, really learn about, you know, what you're doing. Yeah, Fantastic. Definitely. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I'll just have a wee look there. Um, let's see what other questions I've got. I've got a question from Rick Walker, which I um, just needed to double check there. Um, you couldn't see where the event is advertised. And so I'll just say all of the events for the Foraging Festival online and for the Orkney International Science Festival are all um, available um, with more information um, you know, for each event on the Orkney International Science Festival website. So that's oisf.org. So I hope you're able to find that there, Rick. Fantastic. Okay, we've well, got a couple there. Oh, I've got a lovely question from Kathleen Hogarth again. Are, are thistles not a prescribed weed? Um, are farmers obliged to get rid of them or only some speci species um, of thistle? Is that the case? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, uh, Kathleen. As far as I know, it is actually um, the creeping thistle that's on that list of prescribed weeds. So I think, and I don't know the, the technicalities of the law around it exactly, so I couldn't say for sure, but I'm pretty sure that's one that's on the list along with a few others that if farmers have a lot of their there's kind of the onus is on them to get rid of it i feel a bit bad giving a creeping thistle a bad press because it doesn't bother me but we can see with with farmers i'm sure it, it can create issues because it's pretty it's a vigorous plant you know thistles do really really mm -hmm. well interesting mm -hmm. thing about thistles though is that all all parts of a thistle are edible uh, whichever thistle species we have in scotland and the spear oh. thistle is the classic scottish thistle mm. and then there's creeping thistle and others and but obviously they look pretty forbidding with all those spines but some of the ones with bigger leaves even if you just trim the spines off they're absolutely fine and and the fact that um, they've developed these spines mean that they haven't had to develop kind of like you know some some plants have really bitter tastes and stuff like that to ward off um, animals Thistles have just got these spikes, so they don't need to be as bitter, so they actually taste all right. You can peel the stems and eat them. Um, yeah, it's a bit fiddly, but if, if you're desperate, they're, they're there. So. Gosh, excellent. I think of oh, how many thistles I see, you know, they're everywhere, and you think, oh, well, actually, there's all this available food. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, we'll move on to our next question, if that's okay. I've um, got a question from Eric Walker here. Is foraging taught or referred to in any of the Scottish school uh, curricula? Uh, that's a good question, Eric. I don't know is the short answer. Um, mm. I don't, because I do some work, do some kind of forest school sessions and stuff, but I'm not involved kind of in the, mm. at the curriculum end so much. We do, I mean, some of the activities we do with children um, involve foraging but this is us doing forest school activities engaging the children and some of those will tick boxes in the curriculum as far as I know mm -hmm. there's nothing within the curriculum that actively talks about foraging but I could be wrong on that so I don't know is the short answer. Gosh perhaps not in Scotland I know myself um, when I was studying in Norway that um, they certainly had foraging classes as part of you know oh. certain curriculum. I remember going out um, foraging for mushrooms and things as part of a folk school activity but yeah, yeah perhaps that's something we could do more of in Scotland at least for safe uh, safe you know areas I think yeah. yes as uh, Freya Henderson has put as well in the comments the risk assessment for that would be a nightmare and I agree it must be very difficult <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, and having said that we are able to do like I say with forest school we do do foraging activities and 
and there's some of the things that I, all the stuff I emphasized before it's like really um making sure of 100% certainty the kids have to tell the adults you know like have to yeah. refer to the adults and the adults have to know what they're kind of know their plants and also keeping it simple so for example like some of my earliest foraging memories are picking brambles and brambles are an easy fruit to identify even then it's good with any fruit get the kids to check mm-hmm. with that first but it's one that you're on pretty safe ground with so if it's a well supervised activity and the kids are being able mm-hmm. to engage it's really um yeah a minimal risk and and it has to be i think it has to be weighed like balanced up in a way because mm. we could go to one extreme and just say the safest thing would be to say don't eat any wild foods at all and mm. then but and that is there's kind of a safety element in there but there's also a huge payoff and there's actually risks in other ways you know we could say like oh, just let's not let the kids go outside or you know taking it to a like almost ridiculous extreme but as we all know there's so many other risks um, and there's um, children really suffering from actually partly not being outside, including like children with mental health problems or obesity or all sorts of things. It's a more complex thing than just being outside. But um, we often do, as well as risk assessments, we often do like a risk benefit assessment is often a, a thing we do. So we look at what are the dangers, but then what are the benefits of particular activities? And that's all part of the assessments. So, but it's a fair point yeah the risk risk assessment is a key part of it and it can be a headache yeah. excellent finding that balance eh yeah. yeah great lovely well we'll just have a look we've got a, a few questions yet um, we've got a comment from fiona graham there she's saying um she likes the inclusion of the gallic names so brilliant i enjoyed that as well lovely See. Um, we've got another question from Kathleen Hogarth. Has any berry or not done particularly well this year, given the good weather? Um, I have noticed, as, actually, as I mentioned in the, the video, hazelnuts this year, I was actually surprised to see how well they're doing. Because I remember it was about seven years ago, we had this really good hazelnut year and made some hazelnut butter and all sorts, and it was great. And then last year was really good for hazelnuts as well hedges around the farm which are stripping with them and so I was quite surprised wandering around recently to see that they're they're looking abundant again so the hazelnut's doing pretty well and actually the rose hips the dog rose here looks really good as well so they're definitely two that seem to be seem to be thriving yeah excellent thank you sure. okay uh, we've got a, a comment here from Eric Walker um, he says his mum used to make a syrupy drink from rose hips. Ah, you mentioned that in your film. And he says, my wee brother, brothers were fed tablespoons of the stuff before they went to primary school. So this is, this is a traditional thing. Gosh. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's interesting because that's, I speak to a lot of people who, especially in kind of in years gone by, who um, would have had, who did have rose hip syrup. And as I mentioned, it was something that was promoted during the war, but no doubt it was in kind of wide use even before then as well. And because, as I said, it's just so high in vitamin C, I think parent mm. or um, carers of whatever kind would give them to, to children, uh, give it to children as a just a really, really high vitamin um, kind of drink and t- taste great as well. So, yeah. Fabulous. We've got a, a very similar... Um, Similar topic question here from Richard Oakley, and he's asking, is C. buckthorn, is that high in vitamin C? Yeah, that's, um, again, that's another one that is amazingly high in vitamin C and some other vitamins as well, but it's, and it's got some other chemicals, like basically really high in antioxidants generally, and it's kind of, it's often cited as a kind of superfood, and it is um, just incredibly good for you. It's pretty, um, potent stuff you've got to cook i find it's so sharp like you can try a berry if you bite a berry it kind of like makes your face almost turn inside out it's so sharp but if you process it in the right way um it's great and you can have it as a almost you can have it like a cordial um mix it with a bit of water and then it's really nice and um yeah but just fantastic and it's do you get it much around uh orkney at all see buckthorn i i I'm not totally sure. In North Ronaldsey, uh, the island where I live, I haven't seen much of sea buckthorn, I'm afraid. Um, yeah. No, but... Yeah, but I was there quite a while ago, so... Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. I'll have to look into it. I was just just curious, but yeah, it's often it's often associated with the coast, and where you do get it, mm-hmm. you can pick and it's um yeah great great source of vitamin C. Fantastic. Uh, let's see. We've got we've got uh, questions coming in and and a few a few more to go. Let's see what we've got here. Um, Kathleen Hogarth saying um, that she made a rosehip jam once. Sticky jam everywhere. <laughs> nice. I'd love to try. I think I've bought some before. I've been given some, but I haven't made it. I'd love to. Yeah. It's lovely. Um, I made some as well. It's it's really tasty. It's really tasty. Yeah, I would certainly recommend if you get all the spines out. Um, yeah. For- uh, anyone listening fantastic and eric walker again rose hip jam rose hips he's talking about we also used to tackle the hairy take the hairy insides out dry them and put them down folks shirts riching powder <laughs> yeah I, honestly when i'm running foraging courses i hit so many people who tell me this and i feel a bit robbed because no one told me that as a kid so i feel like i missed out on this great opportunity um, I might have some catching up to do <laughs> but it's really common and it's funny how i hear that from across like people from the length and breadth of the UK and probably in other parts of the world where there's rose hips as well. Maybe for thousands, mm-hmm. probably for thousands of years would be my guess it's that kids have been. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, the great natural uh, joke shop. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a, a comment from uh, Fiona Graham. She's saying, oh, they, she used to do that too with the itching powder. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, oh, I see. And um, we've got a comment from Eric Walker as well, saying that um, witches were reputed to steal babies and you had to have a rowan tree to prevent against that. So there must be, you know, quite a, there's a traditional, you know, thing to have a rowan tree outside the house. And I certainly know, you know, you have a lot of those stories and music and um, oral tradition. Having a rowan tree is really good luck. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah, it's interesting. And as I think as I said in the video, like across... Um, across Britain really there are various associations of Rowan with protection mm. in that kind of way and, and a lot from the highlands and islands and, yeah it's, it's really interesting some people some sources say that it's the apparently the, the, the vivid red of the berries was supposed to be kind of have particular quality that would um, ward off evil influences and it's yeah it's quite interesting a lot of these um, yeah or bits of folklore around trees and other plants. Sick. Um, we've got a, a comment from Pete here, and he says, wish I'd known about the rowan berries last week before the birds had stripped the, my trees bare of berries. <laughs> so no foraging opportunity there. <laughs> but they've got them already. Uh, oh, that's good. They must have pretty keen. That's, um, and that's the thing, and it kind of ties in, I guess, maybe picked up in the video, but something I find really, um, I guess, interesting about foraging or something I love about it is like how it can teach us more about not only what we can eat and just yeah what other what other animals can eat and I, I feel quite happy in a way if like I don't know if the squirrels get to the hazelnuts before I do I actually love it that I have squirrels in my area you know and I can go to the shop if I need to and um, but the fact that there's um, all this other wildlife that depends on it and if we can get a bit of it as well that's that's great and, um, but yeah it's surprising actually to hear the hear of the realm being stripped so soon because um, usually mm-hmm. they're, they're all there'll be berries kind of well into September, October mm-hmm. and then about continually coming down. And then depends on how many migrant thrushes come through. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, must have had some hungry birds in your area. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh. I've got uh, another comment here from Eric Walker. He's asking, are there any recipes and cooking instructions available? Yeah, there, there are. Um, there's, let me see, there's quite a few good foraging books. And one of the classics, which I'm sure a lot of people will have come across, which I often recommend, is a one called Food for Free by a guy called Richard Maybe. And that was the first, when I was a kid, I was, first came across that book. And that was a real inspiration for me. And um, and he he has a, a few recipes in that. Another one is a few, I could go on with a, a um recipes or books I'd recommend but there's one called the forager handbook as well it's by Miles Irving the forager handbook and that one is a brilliant foraging book that I'd say is a really good accompaniment to food for free and he's got tons of recipes in there and some quite interesting kind of like um yeah kind of unusual or yeah novel recipes so that's a good one that I definitely recommend there's others too if anyone actually if anyone's interested in 
maybe um, in other recommendations books, you can always get in touch through. If you just look through my website, you can just contact me through there and I'll be happy to give you other recommendations and stuff. Yeah. So what is your web address for your website, Dan? So it's Dan Puplets, that's D-A-N-P-U-P-L-E-T-T dot co dot UK. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you for that. Great. Uh, we've got a, a few more. We'll keep going through if you're fine for that, Dan. We'll keep going through some of these fantastic questions. We've had some really good questions so far, I have to say. Um, we've got uh, a lovely comment from um, Megha and Than Ato. Apologies, I've said your, I hope we've said your name correctly there. Um, and she says, thank you, Dan. I've been living in Scotland for a few years now, but not tried foraging before. Very excited to try your suggestions. Right. right. What are some good reference books to start my foraging journey? So we've sort of talked a little bit um, about reference, but do you have anything else, you know, for, for someone just starting out? Yeah, I think what I would say is, again, Food for Free um, by Richard, maybe that's, that's a really good one to start out with. And I always say with foraging, if you are learning from books, it's really good to have a, a plant identification book of some kind, like a flower or wildflower or plant ID book because foraging books themselves some of them are quite good for identification a plant identification book will get you much more kind of a more definite id you know they'll give you kind of certain features that might not be in a foraging book so i think it's always safer to use both just to kind of double check so get food for free and get a good like if you look up collins wildflowers or anything like that get a good plant id book just so you can be 100 percent sure and, and then like i say stick with the the stuff that's really simple and easy to identify brambles dandelions which are often in people's garden are just a, a superfood really nice and um, easy to identify great thank you dan okay we've got a question uh from kathleen hogarth um given the circumstances in the world today do you think we need to be looking at living in a different way and with more connection to and respect for nature yeah, I do probably unsurprisingly, the answer to that is I think we do. Um, and again, and the, the ways we can do that, I think that's a, mm. I guess, a really long conversation. There's so much, um, so much in that. But yeah, the short answer is definitely we need to really reevaluate, I think, a whole, a whole load of things, including um, how we operate as a society. And I guess kind of like consumer society as it is, is, is kind of like a failed experiment in a way or it's, um, there's a lot about it that's creating a lot of damage. So I guess really reevaluating our priorities um, mm. is essential. And and I think as well, it's like for me, there's something about um, appreciating the simple things, like getting more satisfaction from less. So being able to go outside and just like wander around with a few friends and enjoy picking a few berries is just a, to me, it's like a really priceless experience. It literally doesn't cost anything, and for me, it's like something that's really enriching. And, and yet we live in a society that tells us we need more and more and more stuff. And there's obviously a lot of damage done to the environment through that. So that, I mean, that's one, I could go off on a big rant about it, but that's one kind of thing I think is almost like changing our perspective or our appreciation of what's around us. And I think that's one part of, it's, it's obviously much more to it than that, but that's one part of the picture that I think is really important. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, and some questions from, oh, we've got a question from Howie Firth, um, and he's asking, should we look with more respect at the so-class weeds in our gardens? Yeah, great, great question, Howie. Um, yes, again, is the, is the short answer, and I think, um, yeah, it's, it's often surprising to people how many of the things that we call weeds are actually edible or useful in some way. And, and often, I mean, the definition of a weed can often be just a plant that's growing somewhere that we don't want it to be. You know, it's, it's not its fault. And weeds are often plants that frequently have strategies, um, life strategies that are just really, really effective. So they do really well. And But a lot of the things that do grow in our gardens that we end up, a lot of people pulling out some of these plants to plant, you know, um, salad or greens, or whatever. A lot of this stuff we can just eat in the first place, and and it's and one of the uh, some of the things I love about garden weeds. One is that they're really common. A lot of them are really common just by nature. 
So there's not such a risk of over harvesting. We can forage and not create, you know, kind of adverse impact. A lot of them are really, really high in vitamins. So things like dandelion, for example, has way more vitamin A, vitamin C, iron than spinach even. It's just, and there's other, a lot of other wild plants that have similar kind of like really, really high levels of nutrients. And as a bonus as well, they're, they're all generally like really valuable to wildlife. So again, dandelions are great for bumblebees. I see butterflies on them sometimes. Goldfinches, like they love the thistle heads, they love dandelion heads. So it's, yeah, there's so much benefit to, to having weeds around. And obviously that's in balance. This doesn't mean to say I don't pull weeds out occasionally, but often I eat them as I do, or um, I, I deliberately leave a patch here or there because I think they're, they're definitely valuable and, and do deserve a lot more respect. Yeah. Excellent. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. Looking through some of the comments, a few other uh, ones about weeds. Um, we've got one um, from Eric Walker saying, my brother continuously reminds me that weeds are only weeds if you don't want them. <laughs> and I, I've heard that too, you know, a, a weed is a flower in the wrong place. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we've got a, yeah, we'll keep going with questions. We've got a little bit of time, but I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap up soon. We're getting closer to um, a quarter past, and I believe that's the end of the session, unfortunately. So how about we have a couple more questions um, to put to you, Dan? Let's see. So we've got um, one from Fiona Graham asking, do you think invasive species like ragwort are creating problems for native plants? That's, that's a great question. In fact, funny enough, um, ragwort itself isn't, it's not a non-native species because it's, it can be invasive. People assume it's a non-native, but um, it is actually a native with a huge amount of, this is ragwort in particular, a huge amount of benefit for wildlife. Um, there's things, something called the cinnabar moth. There's a load of other um, insects that really like ragwort. It doesn't really have a big impact on other plants. And the key problem with ragwort itself, as I'm sure you know, is that um, when it's um, wrapped up in hay, it can be toxic to livestock. But there are other invasive plants that are introduced, things like Himalayan balsam, Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, and those for sure can have a real impact on native plants, either by shading them out or sometimes by competing for pollinators like Himalayan balsam. The bumblebees will pollinate those and sometimes at the expense of native plants. So there's certain invasive plants that can be a real problem. Yeah. Mm. Great, thank you. Fascinating. Okay, we've got a, a couple more and then I think we'll draw the session to a close. Um, so we've got a question from Martin de Vries. How would you suggest um, you can preserve uh, chanterelles? Um, he says they've got a lot of them at the moment. Oh, okay. Um, to be honest, I've, I've not tried doing any preservation techniques with chanterelles. So I'm not sure, I mean, as I'm sure you know, Martin, like drying is a classic thing with quite a few mushrooms, things like um, seps, uh, penny buns, and some others. With chanterelles, I haven't tried drying them, so I don't know how well they would dry. So I'd, I'd have to look into that to see if maybe there's some other other recommended way of um, preserving them. I have, I bought from the shop before wild mushrooms, uh, or kind of a mushroom anti-pasty mix in oil. So potentially that could be a thing to try with chanterelles is like in some um, oil with um, herbs and other seasoning in. So it could be, could be worth a try. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. And we'll go to our final question to close the session. We've got um, uh, another question from a viewer in Mori. He's uh, saying, uh, so, excuse me, it's Howie Firth. Um, he says, I have a lot of dandelions. What can I do with them? Okay, well, where do we start? Okay, dandelions, pretty much every bit of a dandelion is edible except for the stem. So the stem mm -hmm. has latex and it's not great to eat. But um, some people told me they used to use that as a whistle when they were a kid or a little kazoo. The seeds you can eat, it doesn't fill you up, but it's kind of a novelty food. The flowers you can decorate a salad with, really tasty. The leaves are great in salad or steamed. And the roots you can also roast and make a kind of coffee substitute with them. And that's really tasty as well. There's other things as well, but that's a few, few ideas. Yeah. Gosh, just scratching. It sounds like you're just scratching the surface there of what you can do, you know, with all yeah. this, all these, um, all these 
things you can forage. But I think we will close the session. And I'll just say um, uh, a massive thank you to you, Dan. Thank you so much for um, joining us for this uh, foraging weekend event. Oh, and, um, thank you. Excellent. And thank you to everybody listening. And thank you so much to everybody um, participating. Um, thank you so much for your questions. It's been such an interesting discussion. Um, if you'd like to carry on the conversation, you can join us in the Festival Club. And our next talk today will be at 5 p.m. Um, join us then to hear Nick Card talk about the science of the Ness. And if you are enjoying the festival, please feel free to donate. The full details are below. And please do like us on the Facebook page and follow the YouTube channel. So I'd just like to also say a quick thank you to all of our invisible um, technical team. Thank you so much for everything to Kathleen, Mick, Rainier, Stuart and John. Thank you so much and um, hopefully see you all soon. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.